All right, I want you to take your Bibles, if you will, and I want you to find Philippians, Philippians chapter 3. And I want you to be seated for just a moment. And I want to do something just a little different. This morning, I want to open up with some funnies. Is that all right? I know that uh, laughter is, is good for the soul. Laughter doeth good like a medicine. Come on. Quotes from actual traffic accident reports. I've been driving for 40 years when I fell asleep at the wheel and had an accident. Yeah, I would say so. My car was legally parked as it backed into the other vehicle. The telephone pole was approaching fast. I attempted to swerve out of its path when it struck my front end. <laughs> the guy was all over the road. I had to swerve a number of times before I hit him. <laughs> I thought my window was down, but I found it was up when I put my hand through it. Just some funnies to kick off this morning. I was thinking about graduation this week and their incredible journey getting to graduation day. We often look at that accomplishment, but there is a lot that leads up to the moment. And I really want to honor our graduates today. We took time out to recognize them, but uh, this message is dedicated to them and it's applicable to all of us, but I really want to speak to them today. And uh, definition of graduation is a mark on an instrument or vessel indicating degrees or quantity, the award or acceptance of an academic degree or diploma. So graduation to me means measured progress, something noticeable, something measurable. On this yardstick are marks of graduation, and we always focus in, when we look at a yardstick or ruler or measure, we focus on the large numbers, the one and the two and the three and the four and so on and so forth. But there are these little marks in between, increments, like one-fourth and one-eighth and one-sixteenth and one-thirty-second and one-sixty-fourth. All of those are important, and they show signs of moving, right? They show signs of actual measurements. It, it's moving somewhere. It's advancing somewhere, and it reminds me of our graduates today, and I, I think about one, and I think about kindergarten, and, and tracking those measurements leading up to kindergarten. There were a, a lot of things, a lot of increments, a lot of the the little one sixty fourths, and a little of the one eighths, and the one fourths in their life that got them up to that point. And I look at two as graduation from elementary school. A lot of things went into getting to graduation from elementary school, and then we have three, which would be junior high, and there's a lot that goes into that, and then we got high school, and then we got college graduation. There are a lot of things that happen that are measurable things that we measure that we don't often see. And can I say that God is measuring our lives and the increments of our life, not always the things that can be seen? Come on, somebody. God's looking at our life, and all of those things those little one-fourths and little one-eighths and one-sixteenths, all of those matter in life. And one day, we're going to all experience a graduation day. Amen? One day, we're going to graduate, and it matters how we live our life, not only in the big things, but in the small, measurable things that lead up to those moments in life. 2 Corinthians 3.18 in the New Living Translation says this, So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord, and the Lord who is the Spirit makes us listen more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. More and more, each graduation glorious. Sometimes you see enormous changes, and at other times you just see small incremental changes, a little bit here and a little bit there, but it's still progress. Amen? It's those small things in life. It's the things that nobody sees, 
that's going on in your life, the, the, the progress behind the scenes, so to speak, where God is watching and God is looking and we're not focused on the big things. It's what happens in our life, not in the shining moments, but in the moments that are behind the scenes, behind where God's looking at in the closets of our life, that those things where we other people would say, I wonder if anything's really going on, and, and, and really there is things going on. It's those times when you are alone by yourself and nobody sees and you're praying. It's those times where nobody's watching but you're reading your Bible. It's those times when you are interceding for somebody else. It's in those moments, those incremental moments where life is moving on. It may be slow and it may be small, but those increments of life really Matter. I like what Frederick Douglass said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Amen? All these lead up to graduation day, and as I said earlier, all of us are going to experience a graduation one day, and today I want to talk about the keys to success in life. There's a difference in how a Christian defines success and how our world defines success. Would you agree with that? Our culture defines it one way, and the Bible defines it another way. The world defines success in the three things that I think are most prominent in the life of those that are pursuing worldly success, and that's possessions, power, and prestige. Someone said the successful man is the one who can make more money than his wife can spend. The successful woman is the one who can find such a man. <laughs> the Bible defines success this way, pleasing God and not man. So real biblical success is am I pleasing God? Am what I'm doing pleasing to the Lord? And I think all of us have to look introspectively of our lives and, and ask ourselves that question from time to time. Lord, am I being pleasing to you? Because if you study Matthew 6, you find out Matthew 6 is all about pleasing the Lord. It's not about getting the applause of man. It's about getting the applause of heaven. It's all about doing what God's asked us to do. It's all about moving forward. It's all about pleasing him and glorifying him and acknowledging him and recognizing he is the reason you and I exist. Without him, we wouldn't be here. Aren't you thankful for the Lord this morning? Now, I believe the two greatest people who ever lived outside of the Lord Jesus Christ is Moses and Paul. And this morning, I want to glean from Paul in Philippians, and I want you to stand, if you will, in honor of the reading of God's Word this morning. And I think Paul gives us some keys to success in life, and I want to share them with you this morning and get them in your spirit and in your heart. And when we do that, I think you'll understand what real success is. There could be five or six or seven. I'm pulling out of the passage, out of the word this morning that Paul teaches us. And I think Paul was a great man of God. And some of the things that I will share with you this morning concerning the life of Paul, you would think, well, this Paul who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, this incredible, wonderful man, had it all together. Can I tell you, he didn't have it all together. This one that named Paul who said, uh, the things I shouldn't be doing, I end up doing. And the things I should be doing, I'm not doing. This is the Apostle Paul who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. But he gives us, I believe, some keys this morning that if you'll grab a hold of, put them in your life, and pursue like he did, I think you'll find success in life. Philippians chapter 3, we'll begin reading at verse 7. But what things were gained to me, now Paul is talking about his confidence in the flesh. He's saying prior to that, if anyone has confidence in the flesh, I have it. Circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law blameless. Now listen, but he says, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ 
and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, here's where I want to get, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. It's worth repeating. Paul's greatest desire in life, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Powerful admonition from the Apostle Paul of his desire in life to know Christ in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings. Father, thank you this morning for your word. I pray that you'll hide me behind the cross one more time. Anoint my life. Anoint your words so that as I speak this morning, they might be an oracle from heaven. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us wrap our minds around the passage. I pray you'll help us gather the keys that are essential to living a successful life, not as the world deems success, but what you deem as success. And Lord, we'll praise you for it all in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Let me give you quickly this morning four keys to success in life. Number one, you need to develop a personal relationship with Jesus. That's what Paul said his greatest desire and ambition in life was, to know Christ. You would think that Paul already knew Christ, but he wasn't talking about just a knowledge of who Jesus was. He's wanting to know him on an intimate basis. And Paul wanted to know four things. Number one, he wanted to know him personally, that I may know him, not just about him, not just what I read about him, not what I heard about him, but I want to know him in an intimate way. I want him to touch me, and I want to touch him, John. I I want to know him and everything about him. And this apostle Paul wrote, as I said, two-thirds of the New Testament This incredible man of God says, I want to know him. Well, he wants to know him in an intimate, personal way so that he can have conversation with him, so he can hear from him and and experience him at a level just knowing about him. How many of you know there's difference between knowing about someone and knowing them? Now, Now, I know Alec. I know about him, but I know him. I have a personal relationship with him. I know a lot about his life. He knows a lot about my life. There's a personal commitment to knowing each other, not just about each other. Some of the people in the house I know about, but I really don't know you on an intimate way. Paul is saying, I don't want to just know about Jesus. I don't want to just know about Christ. I want to know him. Because this... The sweeter, listen, the the longer I serve him, the more I get in touch with him, the sweeter he grows. And that happens through an intimate relationship with him. God and I have some intimate conversations. You can't have an intimate conversation unless you have an intimate relationship. Come on, somebody. I have an intimate relationship with my wife. I can have intimate conversations with her because I know her and she knows me. And she knows how much I love her. Secondly, he says, not only do I want to know God personally, but he wanted to know God powerfully. Paul says that I might know him in the power of his resurrection. Paul was saying, I want the same resurrection power that brought Jesus out of the grave in my life. Can I tell you this morning that if you've been born again, you have resurrection power in you? 
And that resurrection power gives us power over sin. So my sin nature, the things that I have to deal with, with sin in my life, and let me make everybody feel better, everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're getting better. Come on, somebody. We're supposed to get better. But there's power, resurrection power to deal with the sin that I have to confront in my life. Things that happen, things that I do. There's power, resurrection power to deal with that. And I think there's enough power in that resurrection power to help me, empower me to not want to sin. We don't talk a lot about it, but holiness is a factor. We're not, we're not talking about holiness in the sense that there's anything holy about you or righteous about you, but your position in Him. And we should pursue holiness. Why should we pursue holiness, Pastor? Because the Bible says, apart from holiness, no man shall see the Lord. We should want to get better. We shouldn't want to just ride it out and say, well, I've been saved and I've been forgiven and now I'm going to go to heaven. You can do that, but you're going to miss out on so much. It is such an enormous, fantastic, incredible, wonderful journey to journey with the Lord. To go with Him, to walk with Him, and to experience Him. It gets better. So there's resurrection power over my sin. I keep getting ice in my mouth. (laughs) Hear the crunch. Resurrection power over sin. But listen, secondly, resurrection power over Satan. That means when you get saved, listen to me, when you get saved, you don't have to let the devil push you around anymore. There's resurrection power inside of you that has power over the enemy. The Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. And and I'm tired of the devil chasing people down. All he can do is try to convince you that you have no power. But you have resurrection power. Listen to me. You have resurrection power inside of you over Satan, over the enemy, and all the wiles of the enemy, all his attacks, everything that he throws at you, you've got something to fend it with. You've got resurrection power. So I don't think he ought to be chasing us down. I think we ought to chase him down, Ms. Galinda. The Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he's got to flee. Put him under your foot where he belongs. Power over sin, power over Satan. Listen, power over our circumstances. Get a new perspective that this resurrection power, no matter what you're facing, what you're walking through in life, whatever your circumstances are this morning, I've come to tell you this morning that God is bigger and greater than any circumstance in your life. He's bigger than any giant you got in your life, bigger than anything that's confronting you right now. Can I tell you this morning, by the authority of God's Word, He has power in healing. Your circumstances may need that you need healing today. You may have cancer today. You may have a sickness. I don't know what that is, but I want you to know there is power over that. No matter what your circumstance is, you got to get a perspective that your God is bigger than any sickness or disease, and we lay hands on people that are sick and pray for their healing. It's not something we do because it seems like the right thing to do, and we just do it. We do it believing. That's why, listen, that's why I don't let just anybody lay hands on me. First of all, I don't want them transferring anything to me. You keep that stuff. I don't want it. But I want someone to pray for me like they mean it and believe that God's able to bring healing in my life. Power over sin, power over Satan, power over circumstances, and power over self. Self's got to get out of the way i got to deny myself, take up the cross, you no longer live. Let me remind all of us this morning, if you are a born-again believer, you don't live. Quit making it about you. It's not about you. i got to have my way, my way or the highway. No, it's not about you. It's not about me. We have crucified ourselves. I don't live anymore, but Christ now lives within me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. It's not just talk. It's not something that we do. It's it's reality. The problems we have oftentimes in the church is because we got people haven't died out. 
There wouldn't be, listen, there wouldn't be any problems in the church. There wouldn't be attitude problems. People wouldn't worry about carpet, wouldn't worry about chairs, wouldn't worry about anything if they all died out. Come on. You talk about a pure, healthy, whole church when everybody dies out. Once you go to that church down there where they're all dead. But alive in the spirit. Come on. We got a live church. We're alive. Come on. So he wanted to know the Lord personally and powerfully. And thirdly, he wanted to know God passionately. Philippians 3 says, look, and the fellowship of his sufferings. He wasn't going to the cross again. He wasn't saying, I'm going to die on the cross again. Jesus is going to, I'm going to, I'm going to suffer with him. No, he's not going to the cross again. But what Paul is saying, that same passion that drove Jesus to the cross, I want some of that. I want some of that passion. I want to be that concerned about the lost. I want to be that concerned about people making it to heaven. I'm willing to die. If he was the only, if I was the only one, he would have died for me. Nobody takes his life from him. He gladly lays it down. I want that kind of passion that says, Jesus, crucify me, get me out of the way. I'm ready to win the world for Jesus. I want that kind of passion. How many like being around passionate people? Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to be around. I don't want to be around dead people. Well, dead to self, yes, but not. I want passionate people to be around. Our congregation is very passionate about worship because we have a passionate worship leader. We have passionate people. Passionate leadership creates passionate people. And so Pastor Ted's not up here just giving you a little homily and sending you home. I'm interested in knocking a little bark off every Sunday. Come on. Paul says, I want to know God passionately. And then, fourthly, he wanted to know God preeminently. He says, I want to be conformed to his death. What does that mean? That means he needed to die out completely. That means there could be nothing else in the place of God. That means Jesus doesn't want a prominent place in your life. He wants to be preeminent in your life. He doesn't want just a place in your life. He wants to be first and foremost. And when you die to self... A natural thing happens supernaturally, and that is God rises to the top. Make God your priority, and he'll prioritize everything else. And there'll be times where three needs to move to two, and two needs to move to four. But he'll prioritize that, but he's got to be preeminent in our life. Paul says, I want to die to the point where he is first and foremost. I think Paul achieved that. You don't go to prison. You don't go through all the things he went through without experience the preeminence of Christ. Come on. Can you honestly say this morning, Jesus Christ is preeminent in my life? Well, Pastor, I'm not certain whether I can or not. Well, that's a great place to start with honesty. It takes a lot. It takes a lot to give up your rights. Marriage, you give up rights. It ain't, it ain't all about you, sir. It ain't all about you, ma'am. You got to give and take in marriage. Come on, somebody. If you're going to have a healthy marriage, you got to learn to communicate. But you can't be the one that's always doing the talking. Sometimes you need to just shut up and listen. Some of y'all, oh, help me, Jesus. Some of y'all are just a little silence away from having a great marriage. (laughs) Yeah, I said it. (laughs) It's true. Paul told us his greatest desire and motivation was, I want to know him. So the first key is to develop a personal relationship with Jesus. Number two, you got to decide to never get complacent or comfortable. 
Not that I've already attained or am already perfected. You must see where you are to get to where you need to be. Even the Apostle Paul did not think that he knew the Lord Jesus personally, powerfully, passionately, and preeminently as he should. That ought to be an encouragement to us. The Apostle Paul was basically saying, I still need to grow. No Christian, no growing Christian is ever satisfied with his spiritual attainment. I want to be a better Christian. I want to be a better pastor. I know I keep saying it, but I do. I want to get better. I'm not satisfied. Listen to me. Pastor is not satisfied with his spiritual life. I want to get better. Now, I'm not saying I'm dissatisfied with my salvation, and I'm certainly not dissatisfied with my Savior. You know, the reason that many people don't grow is because they think they're fine just where they are. If you're to be a growing Christian, you've got to decide in your heart to never get complacent or comfortable. I don't believe there'll ever be a greater Christian, a greater man than the Apostle Paul, certainly not in the New Testament times. And when he wrote these words, he wasn't at the first of his ministry. These are not the words of a rookie Christian. I mean, the Apostle Paul is in that Philippian jail, an aged old man waiting to die and go to heaven, and he says that I may know him. You've got to get to the place, you've got to get to the place where you are not complacent and comfortable. We don't ever arrive. We got to get better. I, I am, listen, I am dissatisfied where I am. And I'm better today than I was yesterday or the week before or the month before or the year before. But I'm not happy where I am. I, I'm, I'm content in the sense that I'm content in the Lord. I lay down my head at night and I have peace. But I want to get better. I don't want my flesh to do certain things when people pull out in front of me. I don't want to respond. The first response being my flesh. I want to be patient. I want to be kinder. I want to be gentler. I want to be more understanding. I want, I want all of those things in my life. Come on. You got to decide to never get complacent or comfortable. Number three, you got to devote your life to looking forward, not backwards. You got to develop a personal relationship, first of all. Decide to never get complacent or comfortable, but then you got to devote your life to looking forward, not backwards. Too many people are looking backwards. The rearview mirror is small for a reason. Come on. Because you're not always, the windshield is really big, but the rearview mirror is small. You're supposed to glance at it and then move on. Come on. Look at what he says. Brethren, I do not count myself to apprehend it, but one thing I do. He didn't say two or three things. One thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Putting those things in the rearview mirror. Paul says, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. What are some of the things in the past that we need to let go of? Some of you, listen to me, some of you need to let go of your past guilt. We've done some things, all of us have, that we're not proud of. Let it go. Believe that the blood of Jesus is able to cleanse you and make you whole. Those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things have become new. That, that guilt that you felt that drove you through conviction to Jesus was driving you there to get you saved and to get you out of that sin. But that guilt was not meant to stay around and haunt you forever. Jesus has taken what you did, regardless of what it is, in the sea of forgetfulness, he has removed it and thrown it there. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed your transgression. Some of you need to let, let it go. Some of you can't be everything God wants you to be because you're weighted down with the guilt of what you did. Our, our problem is never 
God forgiven us. Our biggest problem is learning to forgive ourselves. we got, we got to learn to allow God to allow us to let ourselves off the hook. Secondly, not only past guilt, but here we go. Pastor, going to get the meddling. Past grudges. Oh. Oh, you went there. Yes, I did. Let it go. Well, you don't know what they did to me, Pastor. No, I don't. But it doesn't matter. You don't know what they've been saying about me. It doesn't matter. Boy, if I, if I didn't, oh, help me, Jesus. If I had a dollar for everything that somebody said about me, I'd retire and sail off into the wild blue yonder. No, I wouldn't do that because I'm called of God. i got to do what God's called me to do. But grudges is, you know what grudges does? When we hold on to grudge, it's like taking rat poison hoping somebody else dies. They just eat you up. It doesn't bother. They're not, they're not staying up at night worrying about it. So whatever that grudge is, let it go. Some of you don't have peace because you won't let it go. You've been holding on to it forever. And God sent you here to this church, to this crazy pastor, to tell you to let it go. So you can finally be free. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. You know what you do when you hold a grudge? You give somebody power over your life. You ain't getting power over my life. I don't care what you do to me. I'm not going to hold on to it. I'm not going to let that just destroy my relationship with him. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to give anybody that kind of power over my life to let them think that it's really bothering me. Now, does it bother me sometimes? Yes. I'm human like you. But I'm not going to get enamored in it. I'm not going to stay there and get out here on my pity porch and stay there forever. Can I tell you a unique thing and a great thing God's been doing? This is awesome and this is wonderful. I've been, and I shared this on Wednesday night. God has been restoring relationships that have been broken in my life with people. Come on. You know, you know how it happened? People started, including pastor, started swallowing pride. And deciding, on life's way too short for that. And now we text, call. Love you, man. Hope things are going great. Encouragement and things like that. Where once it was divided, there was no conversation for many years. You talk about the power of God. God, and I believe in these last days, God is restoring relationships. But you're going to have to be the bigger person. And you're going to have to let it go. And you're just going to have to pick up the phone and say, listen, whatever is between us, I'm sorry for my part. You don't have to own their part. Own yours. And it takes two. Your marriage problem isn't just him, ma'am. And your marriage problem isn't just her, sir. It takes two. You just got to talk. Some of you are so mad at each other, you won't even talk. Oh, I thought this was going to be a success sermon. It is. It's going to be real successful if you listen and apply it. Yeah. Marriage isn't going to get healed. Pastor talking about the key to successes, and we had a marriage revival. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> past guilt, past grudges, and then past glory. Those shining days are wonderful. And listen, yesterday's home run doesn't count today's ball game. Salesman of the year was last year. We want to glory in this, and we're just pulling up our trophies and showing all that. Get over it. It's great for the moment. It's an accolade. I, I think it's important. But you can't live off past glories. You need some new moves of God in your life. I'm not living off of yesterday's glory. Hey, listen, 
a few years back when my mama got saved. It's been many years now. But when my mama got saved, one of the most glorious days of my life, I was preaching on a Sunday morning when my mom answered the call to the altar. I saw her back in the back, and she was weeping, just tears flowing down her. And I was preaching on a sermon I entitled, One More Night with the Frogs. Someone got saved. Many people got saved. It's really about Pharaoh and the plagues. And, and Moses said to Pharaoh, when should I entreat the Lord so you'll let my, his people go to worship him? And Pharaoh said, tomorrow. Well, time and time again, tomorrow never came. The next day would come, he'd go to Pharaoh and say, no, I changed my mind. I'm not going to do that. It took the death of every firstborn. Before Pharaoh relented and let God's people go to worship him. And I asked the question that morning, what will it take for you? What's going to have to happen in your life before God gets your attention where you'll surrender your life to him? And I opened up the altar. It's one of the greatest moves of God I've ever been a part of. People came to the altar weeping and crying. I mean, I I didn't even really have to give an invitation. They were just people literally sobbing, coming out of their seats. And and I'm looking, and I see my mama step out in the aisle. No joke. This is the God's honest truth. I said, "Woo! that's my mama. (laughs) And I got down here, my mom crying, tears just flowing. One of the greatest days of my life, I got to lead my mama to the Lord. And she's in heaven today because of that. I got through praying with my mama, and, and I had a niece that was attending Belmont University on a basketball scholarship, an incredible young lady. And I looked back toward the altar, and she was there that morning. She stepped out of the altar, and I said, Woo, here comes my niece, too. And it was one of those moves where God just poured out his spirit, and I led her to the Lord, and she's a faithful Christian in Clearwater, Florida, serving the Lord. And I'm thankful, but I'm not living in there. I'm not, I'm not living in that past glory. I'm thankful for it. But I'm looking for a new move. I'm looking for another Shekinah glory being poured out in the house. I'm looking for a move of God where God can do what He wants to do. Change our lives. And he says, in reaching forward to that which is ahead, Paul said... This one thing I do, I move forward. It's time for us to move forward. Amen. Then the fourth thing, and I'll close with this. The fourth key is to determine to never give up. Look at verse 14. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The word press means to relentlessly pursue. You can't have a take it or leave it attitude. And you can never give up and you can never quit. Let me tell you something about a race. I don't care how far ahead you are. If you quit before you reach the finish line, somebody else is going to win the race. The Apostle Paul, do you know where he wrote this? Paul was in prison. I mean, he's an old, broken down man. He's in prison waiting to be beheaded. And he's still running like this with all of his might. If you could have seen that body stooped over, squinty-eyed, scars all over his body, 195 stripes laid on him. He had fought with wild beasts. He'd been stoned and left for dead, let down over a wall in a basket, fasting, all of these things. There he is, this little old Apostle Paul in prison. But he says, I'm pressing onward to the goal of the call of Christ Jesus. With all my might, he says, I'm running for the goal. And he's still running. I'm talking to some soul winners. You were once soul winners, but you're not soul winning anymore. I'm talking to some tithers who were once tithers, but you're not a tither anymore. I'm talking to some prayer warriors who were once prayer warriors, but you're not a prayer warrior anymore. I'm talking to some workers. You were once kingdom workers, but you don't serve and work anymore. Don't be a quitter. Keep running your race. Keep your faith intact until you cross over the finish line. It's important to never give up. Four keys to real success in life. Develop a personal relationship with Jesus. Decide to never get complacent or comfortable. Devote your life to looking forward and not backwards. And determine 
to never give up. That is the ingredient. That is the keys to success. Christian success. And what it means to be a Christian. I want you to stand to your feet with me, if you will.